China's national goal is to realize a moderately prosperous society by 2020. And as President Xi Jinping has made clear, China cannot be a moderately prosperous society if any of its citizens continue to live in extreme poverty. China has already lifted over 700 million people out of poverty, by far the greatest anti-poverty campaign in world history. But still, there are about 40 million people living in extreme poverty. And these cases are the most intractable, whether for reasons of geographic isolation or personal hardship. How does China plan to eliminate extreme poverty in three years? What are the challenges, the obstacles? Moreover, how reliable is the data? And even if successful, what happens after that? Just because a family's income has been raised just over the extreme poverty line for one year hardly makes them moderately prosperous. How then to make China's poverty reduction campaign sustainable? When we follow poverty reduction, we cannot get any closer to China. Since adopting its reform and opening up policy, China has made remarkable progress. Still, the government faces difficulties and challenges, particularly during times of social transformation and transition. In 2016, China's Gini coefficient, an index from 0 to 1 that measures wealth inequality, was 0 0.465, higher than the internationally accepted warning line of 0 0.4. This means that too large a proportion of social wealth is held in too few people's hands. A rising polarization of wealth often leads to social stress, undermining social stability. Moreover, the level of inequality is rising faster in the countryside. While incomes increased faster in rural areas, absolute inequality between countryside and urban incomes also increased. China has been working to bridge the gap between haves and have-nots. Deng Xiaoping, chief architect of China's modernization drive, pointed out that if there was polarization, then reform would have been a failure. Since its reform and opening up to the world, China's poverty reduction has been broadly divided into four phases. The first phase was from 1978 to 1985. Reforms gave farmers more freedom of independent managerial right. Based on the poverty standard at the time, the reforms helped reduce the number of poverty-stricken population by half, from 250 million to 125 million. The second phase was from 1985 to 2000. The focus was China's poverty-stricken counties, and the policy of development-oriented poverty alleviation was implemented. Based on the poverty standard at that time, over the 15-year period by the end of 2000, the number of poor people was reduced from 125 million to 30 million. The third phase was from 2000 to 2010. Poverty alleviation began to focus on villages. A new higher standard of poverty was then established so that over the 10 years, the number of rural poor based on the new standard dropped from 94 million to 27 million. The fourth phase is from 2011 to 2020 with the goal that the impoverished rural population should have stable access to adequate food and clothing, compulsory education, basic medical services, and housing. I speak with two thought leaders in China's poverty alleviation drive. Su Gao Sha is chief of the general office of the State Council Leading Group Office of Poverty Alleviation and Development, and Professor Wang Sanghui is director of the Anti-Poverty Research Center of Renmin University of China. Madam Su, let's start by getting a sense of the current situation for poverty alleviation in China in general, and also the office uh, from which you work, the State Council Poverty Alleviation and Development Office. In my career, which focused on poverty alleviation, now is the best time I've ever seen. I started my work with poverty alleviation in 1991 and then devoted myself to policy research for a while. 
Now I do macro coordination. In retrospect, looking back to 1991, the Central Committee's attention on poverty alleviation, direct leadership of party secretaries and governments at all levels, devotion of the cadres and public in poverty stricken areas, as well as care and support from all social communities and policy support from the central departments are all unprecedented in history. President Xi Jinping has said, of course, that poverty alleviation is a major part of creating the Xiaogang or the moderately prosperous society, and so it's a national focal point. Um, but he also said that the period we're entering into now is really the toughest time uh, for poverty alleviation. Why is that? Why is now the toughest time? Uh, and what are the prospects um, for dealing with this toughest time? The poverty cases left over, from our perspectives, face three especially difficult problems. First, in those heavily impoverished regions, natural conditions are harsh. For instance, the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, the Lowest Plateau, three areas in southern Xinjiang, Liangshan Yi Autonomous Prefecture, Niujiang River, Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region, etc. Most of these areas have harsh ecological environments with scarce per capita natural resources. Then, they are mainly inhabited by ethnic minorities in border areas, so they have a very inferior starting point and lag far behind the national average in terms of development. The second difficulty is to do with poverty-stricken villages. We have more than 120,000 such villages where around 60 percent of the poor live. Major problems for these villages are that they are too remote and backward in development and capable young people are all leaving. We have technical term referring to such villages with few strong young people as shell villages. All that are left are the kids, the elderly and the sick. No young people available can help lead the village development. The third difficulty is, among the poor, a very high percentage of poverty is caused by illness. According to data in our record files, 42 percent of the poor households live in poverty because of their sick family members who have lost their capability to work and cause heavy medical burdens on the household. This problem cannot be addressed by short-term measures. Therefore, in-debt poverty is closely related to problems of these three aspects. Targeted poverty reduction implies more accuracy in all aspects of the large program. Poverty definition, measures application, project establishment, finance, designating the right people to offer help, and having the right effects. The government's poverty orientation strategy features five major methods of anti-poverty alleviation. Industrial poverty reduction, relocating impoverished households to other places, ecological compensation for those living in ecologically vulnerable areas, promoting education, and providing social security for those who do not have the capacity to work. While these measures may look good on paper, in reality, during the course of executing targeted poverty reduction, problems arise. Formalism in poverty reduction means that concrete measures have been degraded with overwrought bureaucracy. Some rural officials put all their energy into generating a sea of lists and forms in order to display their achievements with rosy figures cooked up in offices which masks the true meaning of the data. In order to complete the tasks assigned by the government and to advance their careers, some officials exaggerate their achievements by submitting false reports. Worse, in places that lack supervision of local officials, corruption can easily occur. In 2016, 1,892 people working in poverty reduction were put up for investigation, more than a 100 percent year-on-year increase. To implement the anti-poverty strategy at its basic level, and to avoid the formalism of deciding success or failure almost arbitrarily, China must remain resolute and tenacious. You've had a great deal of experience in running these programs, and they're all different kinds based upon individual needs. Uh, I hear a lot of the success stories, but sometimes it's more interesting to learn about the failures, which pro uh, programs and, and uh, projects did not work, 
and what we can learn from them. So what are some examples uh, in your experience of uh, poverty alleviation programs that didn't work or didn't work so well and why was that the case and what did you learn from it? For anything to proceed and progress, there are bound to be successes and failures. The wind won't always be favorable. We have five major methods for poverty alleviation, and for each and every one trial, there are problems that follow. The biggest challenge we face for development in poverty-stricken areas is poor resources. With sufficient resources plus favorable rural policies in China, these places should have no problem lifting themselves out of poverty. However, in many of the poverty-stricken areas, natural resources and per capita land are limited. In places like southern Xinjiang, annual precipitation is only 200 millimeters and per capita land is not yet one mu, heavily bound by natural conditions. So it is particularly difficult to find an industry to rely on for development. Once we find some opportunity, people swarm in and cause homogeneous development. Products pile up, prices drop. We have tried to grow tangerines in acidic soil in South China. We have planted trees several times in the north. We grow apples. In hilly areas, we grow potatoes. But because our poverty alleviation industry affects the price of products across the country, the agricultural products we grow do not sell. Large areas of poor harvest in Inner Mongolia, Shanxi Province, Gansu Province, Ningxia Autonomous Region, etc., all give us memorable lessons. Up until now, we cannot say we have addressed the root cause of the problem. We have cooperated with the Ministry of Agriculture in mapping out a development plan for industries in poor areas to guide farmers' development in different directions. In this way, we prevent homogeneous development that costs oversupply and a drop in prices where farmers have harvested crops but get no income or even less income out of more crops. All such phenomena exist. Honestly, they are not properly addressed. Besides, for farmers that lived in very remote areas or ecologically fragile and key natural reserves, we have a migration project for poverty alleviation. We move them to small townships or central villages where houses are built for them to live together. This helps us to reduce the costs of building mountain roads and providing electricity and also changes their living environment in a fundamental way. Many places are not suitable for living in. With our migration project, we improve their living conditions and make schooling and health care much easier than before. However, some fail to find a job in the new living environment and are thus faced with a shortage of income. So despite better living conditions, their livelihoods are affected. This is a serious issue. So now, as we initiate migration projects, we try at the same time to create production projects. In Chushui County, Lhasa, there's a village called Sanyo. As we moved to the villages up the hill, we helped build chicken farms and cattle ranches. As farmers select houses to live in, they also choose the industry they work for. Otherwise, they will not move before they find themselves a suitable option. So how we can guarantee them a living and help them increase their income after moving, this is a relatively big problem we face. Honestly speaking, every major project has its own you, problem. You are a scholar, uh, you work with colleagues uh, in the U.S. and in Europe uh, and are true to your uh, academic integrity. So you're able to look at the program that the government does, that different uh, uh, non-governmental uh, foundations and charities are involved in, um, but everybody has their own agenda. You, you have an, a, at least a degree of independence to be able to view this, which is valued by all sides, uh, and uh, part of your responsibility is not just to be a cheerleader in saying how wonderful everyone is, but to look for problems and help them solve them. So how do you assess right now where we are today, roughly three years before the 2020 deadline? Uh, where, where is China today and what are the challenges? So our world, I think China is on track um, in terms uh, of achieving the, the, the goal. Uh, sure, there are uh, a lot of challenges. 
because uh, poverty, it's exploring a poverty uh, animation program is targeting at the individual household or individuals. It's much more difficult um, uh, than targeting at the, uh, at the region level. So for a long time, actually, Chinese poverty reduction program is what we call regional, regional poverty targeting. So identify poor regions. The region can be very large, like the 14 regions, we call it with diff, uh, 14 poor regions with special difficulties. The other regions usually, uh, several provinces uh, consist, constitute one region. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, a, a big, that's a big big, mountain huge, yeah, big right. it's bigger than most countries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, the second level is the county. So we have poor counties. Now China have 832 poor counties. So we just also target at the county level. But at the same time, we're also targeting at the village level. So we have one, 128,000 uh, poor villagers. Um, so we, we're targeting from different when levels. When you say a poor village, uh, what percentage of the people in a poor village have to be living below the poverty line in order to classify as a poor village? So that's a, uh, I think the definition of poor village is, is a comp complicated process. It's not be just based on one, one figure. Okay. Uh, it's remote less, and uh, so it's, uh, it's the income level, um, also infrastructure, Situation, sure. uh, social services, uh, those were taken into consideration. So this actually is done by local government. Uh, so the central government uh, do not have uh, actual uh, clear um, definition. How do you have confidence in the reliability of the statistics, particularly because it has to be collected on the local level, and local people will want to show how well they are doing their job, and so whoever does it, they'll know that the local people want to show progress, and so there'll be a built-in bias to, be, to show success. Uh, do you have an independent way of assessing the accuracy of the reports? The problem you mentioned does exist. The local governments have their own interests involved. In the past, as the nation arranged poverty alleviation policies, local governments tended to exaggerate the level of poverty to get national support. However, in recent years, the central government has made it clear that by 2020, we must achieve the target of poverty eradication. Those who fail will take on the responsibilities. Therefore, over the past two years, governments have had a new tendency to show off their performance with exaggerated achievements in poverty reduction. Those who haven't reached this standard are also removed from the list of poor households. Such a phenomenon is not rare in local areas. So starting from 2016, we initiated an anti-formalism event that forces the local governments to be true to their figures. We have no third party that can re-enter or recheck the local data. However, in our third-party evaluation system, we think accuracy of the data relating to poverty and exiting poverty as the most important parameters. This is how we supervise and urge the local governments to truthfully reveal the poverty reduction progress. The Central Committee also continues to come up with new requirements. They made it clear that even if government officials achieve poverty reduction targets in advance, the favorable policies of the Central Committee remain the same. The chief county leader and the party secretary remain in their positions and cannot leave. In November 2015, the CPC Central Committee and the State Council jointly issued its decision on winning the fight against poverty. By 2020, the state is committed to ensuring that the rural population living below the current poverty threshold will be lifted out of poverty. The focus is on impoverished counties, thus solving the problem of regional poverty. In March 2016, the outline of the 13th five-year plan for national economic and social development was released, laying out strategies for achieving the overall goals of poverty alleviation. In his 2017 New Year's greeting, President Xi Jinping also made his commitments. The whole party and the whole of society should show continued care 
and offer help to their fellow citizens living in poverty. We will enable more people to enjoy the fruits of our reforms and ultimately let all of the people in this country live in happiness. We will make sure that no one is left behind on our way to prosperity. In 2017, according to the official plan, the rural poor population will be reduced by over 10 million. What's the role of the CPC, the Communist Party, in poverty alleviation work, particularly on the local level? In poverty alleviation, we have a requirement for the party secretaries at five levels, namely the provincial, municipal, county, township, and village levels to pass down the baton of poverty alleviation one level after another. As governments have a hierarchical structure, party secretaries at the five levels should all go out for their own poverty alleviation progress. This is determined by our fundamental system and serves as our national strategy. In terms of management, we arrange resources for poverty alleviation, and we pass down policies for poverty alleviation. A series of leadership institutions gets passed down through party secretaries at corresponding levels. In addition, we have party building projects at the rural grassroots to promote poverty alleviation. At the one hand, the grassroots organizations play leading roles in building up files with poverty identification. Villagers will apply for themselves first. Whoever thinks he needs the country's help should come and apply. Then a villagers' meeting will be convened to evaluate and discuss who are more eligible for enjoying the national policy and then setting up record files for them. All such work is coordinated and organized through party organizations. On the other hand, in terms of arranging for resources for poverty alleviation, deciding on who needs loans, who needs subsidies for kids' schooling, who needs national medical treatment with serious ill patients, work as such is all supported by the village party organizations who call up villagers for discussion and then get the policy implemented. Regarding the last question of who can exit after receiving help, it is also the village level organizations that convene discussions, report to the upper level and come up with conclusions. Basically, the village level organizations are playing a crucial role in organizing the grassroots and motivating farmers to accomplish the government's task. Well, one concern I've had is that since everything is obviously controlled at the local level, controlled at the county level, then expressed in townships, and then at the village level, that the same officials who are implementing the programs and who have this great pressure to eliminate all poverty by 2020, are, the, are they the same ones who are evaluating whether the families are below the poverty line or not? Because if it's the same officials who are implementing the program with the, with the pressure to do so, and then they're the ones who are evaluating whether they made it, that's a clear conflict of interest. Yeah. So the central government already realizes this problem. There's a the conflict of interest. To achieve the goal, the government have a, a new policy that haven't been uh, done before. That's the third party evaluation process. So for uh, uh, Every poor county is the sure you it's your um, uh, responsibility yeah to help the poor and also uh, propose who are uh, uh, the poor and who are not non poor or who have been brought out of poverty so uh, you, you you can propose this but um, the government was sent sent this uh, we call third party humiliation team sure. down to the uh, county villager household level to evaluate. The main methodology is to sim uh, do sampling survey. So identify, randomly identify a number of households and go to the household to check um, whether this household have made the two, uh, two new worries or three guarantees. So uh, it's not purely the, the, the local government that you know, say I have finished this job. That's, that's not, not, not the case. So last year, yeah, they, they already have done um, the third party elimination for a number of persons, pr provinces. The, mm, there are two provinces who uh, need uh, the, 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 the last two, uh, actually are already criticized by the central government. Because uh, the, 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 the evaluation is, uh, yeah, those two provinces is not that good. So with 43 million people that need to be focused on and brought out of poverty, what is the exact process? You talked about identifying them, that's one. 
then coming up with a plan for each is two, and then I assume monitoring and making sure what's happening. So how is this actually done? How are you able to keep track of 43 million people? Is it just done on the local level? Who does it? How do you know it's accurate? And then do you have a reporting system that comes into your office centrally um, in Beijing? Indeed, it is a big problem to guarantee the effects of poverty reduction that involves tens of millions of people. We need a powerful supervision body. To this end, we have newly set up a review and assessment division whose major function is to supervise. We pass down pressure through graded evaluations. This is a special evaluation system designed by the Central Committee. There is an important part in the evaluation system called a third-party evaluation. In our evaluation of different provinces every year, the Chinese Academy of Science are asked to help us organize universities around the country to send delegations to some random counties for investigation. In 2016, more than 2,000 staff went to local villages to fill out questionnaires. These efforts were mainly designed to evaluate how accurate the government's identification of the poor household is, how accurate is the percentage of the households that get lifted out of poverty, and how satisfied villages are towards the poverty reduction program. We cannot say our questionnaire covers every household, but such an evaluation system has created pressure on the provincial governments who will follow suit and select their batch of researchers and investigators to do research in their counties. What's the process if uh, goals are not met, if uh, on a local level or even provincial level that you, you've been setting for the um, each year to bring a certain amount of people out of poverty so the total amount gets less and less? Uh, in some cases, I'm sure that people have not met their goals or maybe to even try to falsify numbers. Uh, when you have such failures, uh, what is your response to them? Every year, we evaluate poverty reduction work in each province in order to prevent their ultimate failure in the last year. But in each year, we allow a certain degree of failure and tolerate small problems and loopholes. However, failures come with punishment. The governor and party secretary of the province will be given a talk with the Central Committee, which in China is a disciplinary sanction. Based on 2016 evaluation results, governors and party secretaries that failed to fulfill their mission were asked to a meeting with the leading group office of poverty alleviation and development in April 2017. All those leaders tighten up their schedule in improvement after their meeting with the Central Committee. In the coming four years, such measures will be taken every year. If an annual goal is not accomplished on time, punishment and criticism will be given to promote adjustments and improvements to guarantee that the general goals will be accomplished by 2020. China's unprecedented poverty alleviation campaign for all its historic accomplishments faces at least three challenges. First, is the data reliable? There would be an obvious conflict of interest if the same people who did the poverty alleviation work also did the poverty alleviation assessment. We're told that independent organizations do the checking or the double checking, but I still hear talk that some data is suspect because local officials are under great pressure. Second, What's to prevent those who are pushed just over the extreme poverty line after the excitement dies down from falling back down below it? If China's poverty reduction campaign will be counted a true success, it must produce sustainable change. Third, living just over the extreme poverty line, for that matter, is hardly a decent life. It's far below that enjoyed by China's burgeoning urban middle class. The good news is that senior leaders are aware of all these challenges and determined to face them. Poverty in China is a prime concern for President Xi Jinping, so too for Closer to China.